Yes, uh, I think that everybody is back. So uh, we'll start first by an announcement uh, that relates to the uh, software cluster. Sonia? The security cluster? <laughs> but software needs security, so you're, you're right. Um, just uh, briefly, so anyone in the security luster, cluster <laughs> la lusting after security uh, or uh, even just, you know, vaguely interested in security <laughs> and uh, curious, uh, we will have our informal cluster meeting on the other side of this wall where there are tables and chairs right after this. Yes. Good, excellent. Okay, so we'll start with Fredrik uh, and Virginia telling us about uh, Actually, elements. One more first. What, before elements that, of AI, okay. So I took the opportunity since we just had an introduction of a large number of different initiatives. I, I was going to introduce another one. Uh, so many of you might have heard about this course, Elements of AI, that has been developed by University of Helsinki uh, and uh, so in Finland uh, and promoted to educate at least 1% of the Finnish population. Uh, so this has been a very successful uh, course in Finland, and now we're taking it back. Back? <laughs> Are we taking it back? No, we're taking it uh, to Sweden. Um, don't quote me on that one. No, sorry. Um, so we're going to take it to Sweden, and it's going to be launched uh, uh, on Wednesday. And I just received a phone call from the uh, uh, Minister of Digitalization, Anders Ygeman, so he will be there uh, opening it on Wednesday. And, uh, and uh, the basically the point of the course is to educate the general population and everyone in the foundations of AI. So trying to give a more nuanced picture of what AI is and some of the different techniques behind AI. And for those of you who want credits for this course, Linköping University offers a Fristo on the Kuss. So each and every one of you can get two university credits uh, by applying to this course. No, you don't. <laughs> it's not enough to apply. You have to finish the course as well. So sorry, Lars, no points for you. <laughs> yes. So. so so uh, currently there is uh, English and Finnish, and the Swedish one, we're putting the final touches on that. So the, the Swedish version will be launched on Wednesday. And uh, we have both AI Competence and AI Innovation, who has been involved in this, uh, and Linköp University is the academic partner. Uh, so so I, th I think uh, two weeks ago we had about 1,000 people registered for the course. So we'll see, I mean, for the the credit course at Linköping University. We'll see how many actually finish it. <laughs> but I think this will be a great uh, opportunity for, for different companies. What we will see is a large number of companies pledging to uh, educate a large percentage of, the, of their employees. Uh, so, so that can be another opportunity for your companies or your organizations to organize uh, like local study circles or similar and uh, uh, make sure that as many people as possible in your organization knows a little bit about AI. So I think this is actually a great opportunity and it's uh, funded by Venova as well. Okay, now we can take the other presentations. So Virginia, please no, I can join. join me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to present three uh, different initiatives. Uh, the European uh, Commission High-Level Expert Group on AI, Claire and Jumaine AI. And, and uh, Virginia, maybe you want to introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, Virginia Digman, I'm professor at uh, Umeå University. I arrived here in Sweden formally in September, but I have been mostly since January in here. And I'm working on the ethical and societal aspects of artificial intelligence, which tomorrow I will tell a little bit more about what are the plans of WASP for that. Excellent. So basically, the, the background when it comes to AI and Europe, uh, so there's been some, some studies and so on saying basically that uh, when it comes to research, Europe is actually doing reasonably well. I mean, you can look at the kind of total number of publications in AI venues, uh, and Europe is, is doing quite well. Uh, I mean, on par with the US and China. Uh, but the real difference is actually that the uptake by organizations and companies is very low. And also that the private investment 
in AI is quite low compared to, to the US and China. Uh, and of course, we all know that there is a lack of uh, highly skilled people, but this is not a European phenomenon, but it's more a global phenomenon that there is a lack of skilled people in this area. Uh, so uh, the European Commission is currently working towards that uh, by 2025, there should be an annual investment of 20 billion euros per year in AI. And that the, the commission is uh, aiming to provide about 3 billion euros of that, which means that the private and public and member states and so on uh, have to contribute with other 17 billions. Uh, so of course that will be a challenge actually to kind of uh, get more uh, investment into AI. So I mean, this uh, Knut and Elise Wallenberg um, initiative is of course really great with the WASP initiative to provide more funding to the area. So uh, the European strategy on artificial intelligence is based on three, what to say, pillars. So the first one is to boost AI capacity and uptake. So it's really about building the capability and getting it into companies. Uh, also to prepare for those socioeconomic changes that we know will be coming. Uh, so even though, I mean, personally, I don't believe that there will be a large number of jobs that will disappear, but I think that every job will change. And of course, that will cause a lot of socioeconomic changes. And the third pillar is to ensure that Europe has an appropriate eth ethical and legal framework. And in some sense, that is, I would argue that is kind of the bet that Europe is making that by developing the right kind of AI, we will be the, the leader or the ones can really push that aspect. Uh, so to provide, uh, to develop this uh, ethical framework, um, there's been set up a high level expert group um, where we have 52 experts coming from different uh, uh, backgrounds. So we have people from industry, from academia, and also from the civil society. And Virginia and myself are, are two members of this group. Yeah. And uh, we have two deliverables. Uh, the first one we have already de delivered, which is these ethical guidelines for artificial intelligence that was uh, uh, published on the 9th of April. And now we're working on policy and investment recommendations, which are planned to be presented in the end of June. So with that, I leave the okay, word to you. Yeah. So maybe just some more uh, background on this group. We are indeed 52 people. Uh, I would say we are like 520 expertise in between all those people. And it's quite a challenge because not everybody uh, is an expert on AI from the perspective of the technical aspects of AI, but lots of them are experts in society, in uh, union movements, and uh, all, all types of so societal and industrial aspects. So it is, in a sense, quite a challenge to get 52 people sitting around the table and literally together write a document, and that's what we do in those meetings, which is a quite interesting process to to uh, assist, to, do, to participate on. But anyway, so we are quite uh, proud and quite happy with the result that this uh, the guidelines for, and you have them there, the real thing. Evidence. The, the guidelines <laughs> for trustworthy <laughs> AI uh, that we have developed. It is based in three pillars, which you can see there, that AI should be lawful, that AI should be ethical, and that AI should be robust. The first pillar is something which we are not do, doing. There is another group which is an expert group on legal aspects of AI, which is taking care about what kind of regulation is or not needed and at what kind of level should uh, the law aspect of AI uh, be taken care of. In this group, and our work is about the ethics and the robustness of AI, for which we have developed uh, this document, which which has three parts. In the first one, we describe the principles which AI should adhere, in, as, uh, at least in the view, in the vision of uh, the expert group, and which has been endorsed by the European Union, the European Commission. Then we describe the requirements uh, for these systems, and then we have this assessment list. The principles which we have uh, agreed upon is that uh, 
AI should be firstly based on uh, law, so the, the law is the ground for all what we do. Ethics is some kind of the sky where we would like to be, so those two things is the space where we have to, um, to act. And the principles that we uh, want to adhere on in development, use and deployment and research on AI is respect for human autonomy, the prevention of harm, fairness and explicability. From there, we derived these requirements, which are a bit further uh, detailed in the document in terms of uh, more concrete technical and uh, non-technical requirements for AI systems. Uh, we designed as well a list, an assessment list, which is a, a list of uh, 136 questions, which can help organizations and companies to assess how well or how far they are from meeting these requirements. At this moment that the document has been published, we are uh, la launching a piloting process to uh, evaluate if this assessment list is in any way useful and uh, uh, relevant. That will be done in two parts, a quantitative survey which will be uh, uh, made accessible to a, as large as possible group of organizations and companies in different sectors and different countries and so on. And then we will we'll have in-depth evaluation with a few selected companies and organizations from different sectors in order to do a kind of a mock-up assessment evaluation to see whether uh, we get some more information about the quality and efficiency of this um, assessment list and f uh, of these requirements. Uh, the second part you can get again. Ah, thank you very much. We do it. Uh, so after these uh, ethical uh, guidelines, we are now working on recommendations to the European Commission. So basically the ongoing commission, the commission that will enter the parliament and also the member states uh, when it comes to uh, policy and investment. So here we have four different kind of impact areas. Uh, transforming Europe's business landscape, so it's basically the, the private sector and this, how do we increase the uptake of AI by Swedish businesses? Uh, but we're also European. looking about... European, not only Swedish. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> I, I, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> also Swedish. <laughs> Sweden is Europe, or? <laughs> um, uh, and then also, so not only the... not just the, the, the private sector, but also the public sector is very uh, important here, and so that we can re really get the benefits out to the citizens of all the European countries. And then we also have attaining world-class research capabilities as one of these uh, impacts, uh, and I'm responsible, uh, one of two uh, people that are kind of the rapporteurs responsible for writing uh, this section. Uh, and then we also have one part more about citizen <coughs> benefits and, and, the, and engagement. So really kind of engaging the general population uh, in this area, because we know there is a lot of what you say, uncertainty, maybe even fear and so on around AI and what the consequences might be. Often they are not really scientifically founded, uh, but of course you need to address these uh, uncertainties and fears. And then we have four enablers or areas where we will be uh, uh, in order to reach these uh, impacts. So the first one is about funding and investment. Uh, the second one is on data and infrastructure. We already heard, for example, from AI innovation about building these kind of data factories and so on, building this physical infrastructure. We also heard from NVIDIA about the huge need of, uh, uh, or the need for large scale computing infrastructure. Uh, and then we have skills in education, which is kind of the foundations. We already heard this, that the uh, lack of competences is one of the major challenges uh, in the area. And finally, we need to ensure that we have the appropriate policy and regulatory framework. So that's another um, enabler. Uh, and besides this group of 52 experts, and I think there are another, another like 50 or even 100 observers. So I think, I mean, when we have the meetings, it's like sometimes 100, 150 people. There is also something called the European AI Alliance, which is open to everyone. Uh, so basically any person or any organization can uh, become a member of this European AI Alliance, and you can be part of the discussion around these uh, deliverables and provide feedback, suggestions, comments, and so on. 
So for instance, this AI Alliance was consulted for the guidelines. We received over 600 comments from 600 different organizations and people. Some of those comments were longer in, in size than the document itself. So some companies really put a lot of effort on that. But it's quite good because we really get all kinds of other visions and perspectives than what the group doesn't have. So it, it has been very useful. And I don't know if some of you are part of this AI Alliance, maybe. But if you are not, please consider joining, because it's really a way that uh, we all have to influence how European Commission and European, uh, the, the new Commission is going to deal with uh, AI uh, developments in Europe. Okay, so that concludes the part of the, on the high-level expert group. Now I will present Claire, uh, which is uh, a in grassroots initiative uh, based on the Confederation of Laboratories for Artificial Intelligence Research in Europe. And basically, the, the challenge is that we have a very fragmented AI landscape in Europe, that there are many different organizations, many different uh, uh, companies and so on that are all interested in AI, but it's hard to kind of get all of these different organizations to pull in the same direction. We can see that even in Sweden, which is a small country, it's kind of not that easy to get uh, everyone to, to move in the right, uh, not the right, but at least the same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I have to be, uh, keep you awake. So you should get one of these sheets. How many mistakes do I say? And then Bingo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, so, want to, so basically, what we want to achieve uh, in this CLEAR initiative are two things. First of all, is to create a network of networks of as many, if not all, uh, the different uh, research centers that exist, uh, and also companies related to AI. And the second is to create an AI research hub in Europe. So, I mean, one challenge that we have is that currently there are three European universities on the top 10 list. Uh, if UK leaves uh, EU, we will have zero of them within the European Union. So we have ETH, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, which means that if we in Europe really, or at least the European Union, uh, wants a uh, place that can be a research magnet for the best talent in the world, I think we really need to build one of these uh, centers. And I also think another very important part uh, is that you need this critical mass in order to achieve really interesting things. Uh, so I think that's another aspect why we need this central hub. And uh, uh, the purpose of this hub is not to kind of take all the resources and take all the researchers and kind of hog them in one place, but rather to provide an excellent working facilities where people come, stay for half a year or something like that, and then they come back to their uh, kind of normal universities and so on, uh, and bringing back the knowledge that they have gained. Uh, so the overarching vision is excellence across all of AI. Uh, so it's not, what should I say, not only looking at, for example, machine learning or other subfields, but to look at all the different subdisciplines of AI, and to also do it for all of Europe. So that it's very important that we cover all the different uh, parts of Europe and also all the different uh, people within Europe and that we want to have a human-centered focus. <laughs> and currently we have uh, close to 3,000 members or uh, groups that have signed up to this initiative. And uh, there's a lot of ongoing activities and uh, discussions moving forward. So, that now I'll leave yeah. to you. So this is another initiative, <coughs> which in a sense is very easy and very quick to tell about, because it's not anymore kind of thing. <laughs> so it is an uh, initiative which was put together by a bunch of uh, group, certified groups, I believe, uh, aiming at developing a proposal for one of these European flagships, like the, the Brain Project or the Graphene Project, which would be mean, meaning that if this would be successful, we would have in the coming 10 years one billion euros invested by the European Union, the European Commission, together with one billion euros, which would come from parties and countries involved. The point, so we were awarded the preparatory action to work on this vision and on this proposal for a flagship. Uh, but in the meantime, the European Commission decided to cancel the whole uh, flagship idea. So now we are kind of preparing an action for something which we don't really know what it will be, but still is a group of people and a, a 
all top researchers on AI in Europe are all involved in the initiative, which works very close uh, together with the CLARE network and with Alice network as well, which we'll hear in, a, in next in next. Set. And the idea is that we are now kind of gathering ideas and gathering uh, suggestions and possibilities to see how we can still make sure that we get this type of flagship with this type of size of research investment, but by other ways that the uh, call for uh, flagships from the Commission. And this is because the H2020, uh, Horizon 2020 program is finishing now. So we are uh, creating all kinds of initiatives and workshops, and hopefully there will be some more uh, information about these possibilities. One of the things in which we are looking at is this new call for excellence centers on AI in Europe, for which there will be this meeting on the 28th of May in Brussels. I don't know who is going to be there. A few, okay. So it's, you really need to, uh, we need to have more Swedish people in this type of networking. It's the place, it's in a sense, very boring meetings, <laughs> very, very, very political meetings, but if you are not there, you are nowhere. So we really need to invest more as Sweden <laughs> to be part of these things, because there is where the networks are decided, is where the programs and the content of these programs are decided. So we really, really have to make this uh, investment on being there. Okay, I think that we are finished. Yes. Yes, Thank you. we are. Okay. And now I can give this to Alejandro. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. <coughs> and you're going to tell us about AI4E. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you for uh, for inviting me to tell something about this AI4E initiative. I'm Alessandro Safiotti from Oregon University here. Um, I think most of you know about the background. Um, there was this call last year uh, for a uh, AI on-demand platform by the European Commission, and the call was basically the result of a about two-year consultation process by the European Commission with a number of experts, uh, which outcome was basically what we just heard. I think the European Commission try to understand by a number of consultation how Europe can eventually catch up uh, with this new field of AI that all of a sudden the discovery is there. And, uh, and they all agree that there are basically two things. Uh, one is that uh, the, we need to solve the fragmentation of uh, AI research and uh, innovation and industry in Europe. Uh, and also we need to have something of a brand of AI in Europe, which is different from what people in the States or in China is, is doing. Um, the first issue was solved by the European Commission at least, uh, by saying, okay, we need to make a call to create a platform that will actually be a tool to solve the fragmentation problem partially. And the second issue was never really, I think, explicitly um, spelled out, but as you heard, uh, all, of the, all of the initiatives about the AI which are happening, and the AI for you is not exception, uh, are around this theme of humane or human-centered or human-centric AI. So obviously this is what uh, turns out to be the sort of European brand of, of AI. So AI for you is actually the project that came up from the call. It's a large project, it's about 80 partners, three years, uh, 20 million euros. Uh, and uh, the goal of the project is exactly what was in the call, so to actually mobilize the European AI community. Um, and by creating a platform, uh, <coughs> a collaborative European platform uh, that should be used by everybody. So the main uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, aims of the project is that to, to create this AI on demand platform. We're going to see in a moment what we mean by that. Uh, um, and also to create all an ecosystem around the platform, to create a number of events, uh, to uh, make to, to push a number of research directions uh, that actually can help uh, um, the signature of AI as being human-centered in Europe, um, and to actually draw a strategic research European, um, <coughs> European agenda. Now, there is some overlap here in what you've just seen, like the, the, the work by the high-level ex expert group. It should be noted that this call happened before the expert group was creating, so the European Commission now is actually playing around with at least three major efforts um, 
making strategic agendas in uh, for for Europe since they're trying to to put the things together. A large project, as I said, these are the um, the partner in the project is a mixture of academic uh, partner research <coughs> centers and uh, uh, large industries and small medium enterprises. Uh, and that's basically how we are going to um, uh, to create this platform as a corresponding ecosystem. The project started the 1st of January, so it's still pretty pretty young. Uh, it consists basically of two main uh, sides. One side is about the creation of the platform itself and populating the platform with uh, content. And another side is about uh, uh, the research activities around the platform and the testing of the platform with a few pilot experiments. Overall, uh, there is a concern about uh, uh, ethical, legal, cultural, and socioeconomic values in the platform. Uh, Virgin is actually also part of this work package here, taking care of those aspects. And of course, uh, there is a part about building the strategic search and innovation agenda from uh, the gaps that will be identified in all these activities. I'm going to detail a little bit a couple of these bubbles. Uh, starting from the platform, so what will be in the platform, um, I think what is probably more important for most of us is the top layer, so how people will be able to use the platform through a service layer. In fact, let me jump directly to this slide. Uh, so the platform is supposed to provide uh, a variety of things to any possible users from AI algorithm and tools to data sets, very important, to also training and education material, or possibly pointers to training and education materials, uh, and uh, access to AI experts, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's supposed to provide these to, basically, to every possible stakeholders, uh, from uh, researchers to industry to, to educators and society at large. From the um, top level side, so from the point of view of the research, uh, we want to actually complement, although the main uh, um, outcome of the project will be the platform, we also want to fill it with uh, content and to put, to create an AI community, aggregated AI community around this platform, using this platform. And for that, we want to push explicitly five particular areas that, in our opinion, are areas that are needed in order to achieve the idea of a human-centered AI, or um, AI systems which are compliant to the uh, human values <coughs> as a center of European culture, uh, be them ethical, social, economical, or cultural, <coughs> cultural values. We identify those specific areas on which we believe there is a need to um, go beyond the state of the art in AI, in AI, AI technologies, to make AI technique explainable, of course, everybody's talking about that also, but also to make AI techniques uh, uh, verifiable, formally verifiable, to guarantee properties like safety, privacy, security, and so on. To make AI system collaborative, so to make sure that AI system will uh, uh, work openly in collaboration with humans, not to be totally, necessarily totally autonomous system, but systems that can uh, transparently collaborate with uh, humans and users. Uh, this is a bit more technical, so to have AI systems that actually can integrate different aspects, different techniques of AI, including data-driven and knowledge-based techniques uh, um, in one system, and uh, AI systems that are able to operate in the same physical environment as, uh, uh, as humans. This, incidentally, is one of the areas where um, we, as the European Commission, believe that Europe has a competitive advantage um, compared to, say, <coughs> the US or, uh, or China, uh, the use, actually, of uh, AI for physical systems, including robots, but not only robots, embedded, uh, embedded AI systems and uh, sensor network and so on. Um, one additional thing that we are going to do is to actually test this uh, platform in a number of pilot experiments. Uh, the pilot experiment will be, there will be eight of them on eight different domains. Uh, they are uh, relatively small experiments which are meant basically to show that uh, 
the AI platform will indeed serve the purpose of making AI technologies available to industries and SMEs. Um, and they will also focus on uh, the specific aspects of uh, some of these aspects of being explainable, verifiable, and so on. The eight pilot experiments are on these eight <coughs> uh, different domains. Uh, I don't give you more detail now. I'm going to be quick, but of course it will be available after that for any more detail you want to you want to have. How many partners? Uh, Seventy-nine. How much money? Twenty million. Twenty million. In fact, is uh, three million are going to for open calls. So only seventeen million. <laughs> Seventy-nine partners. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the money will actually go into the development of the platform. In fact. Um, just to give you an idea of the timeline, so as I said, we started at uh, January this year. Uh, the first version of the platform will be available by the end of this year, actually. Uh, there will be a second version and a third version of the platform, and these will be public, public versions, so you will start being able to see and use the platform uh, uh, from uh, December this year. Uh, there will be some internal version uh, in the project now. One of the reasons why you outside the project may want to actually start uh, using the platform is because we have uh, um, a number of technology transfer third party calls where actually three, three million euros will be used to finance a third party projects, small projects, small experiments uh, that basically are experiment aimed to test the platform in small record type um, very small project. And there will be three open call uh, for that, the first one being uh, announced in December, and probably the deadline will be somehow around March or something like that. So yes, uh, this was to say, I said something more about the platform and the research part and the pilots, uh, but actually the way in which, uh, uh, yep. <laughs> the way in which you can uh, get involved uh, into the project uh, is uh, also by the other activities in the project, especially applying to these third party calls, uh, which is part of the technology transfer programs. Uh, these typically will be calls for small projects involving combination between SMEs and research partners. Uh, um, well, and again, there will be three different is calls. Um, can we can we wait with the discussion yes. for the panel? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Very yeah. Yes, you have a panel yeah. that you can ask all the questions. Good. Um, the other way to contribute is actually to yeah to to start using the platform, put the material in the platform, and getting things from the platform. And uh, of course, there will be a number of events which will be organized by the um, uh, by the consortium. Um, in which you are, we are expected to open this event as widely as possible to the entire, to the entire community. When this is happening, well, you can register right now your, your internet in the website if you want to. Um, very soon we will start to have open call for open event, uh, both small scientific event about some of this research topic and wider <coughs> dissemination event. And from December, you will be able to access the uh, public version of the platform, and uh, you will be able to see the, <coughs> the first call for third party funding. And that's it, and I will leave all the <coughs> rest for the questions and the discussion. Mm, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Thomas, Ellis. All right. So I'm sure you're up for another initiative. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about an initiative called Ellis, where I've been involved a bit. Um, so this is a, um, a bottom-up initiative from machine learning researchers within Europe, I would say. 
that's coming together. And it's clear, I'm using words from the Ellis website, so you'll see the kind of language that's used, and it's a clear focus towards excellence. Um, there was a uh, first meeting held at New Rips uh, in December when the Ellis Society was officially founded. Um, there we go. So it's a clear focus towards the very best academic uh, researchers in Europe with uh, collaboration with people in industry doing basic research. So at companies like Google, DeepMind, for example. Um, and a mission uh, statement, um, which is similar to what, what most organizations <laughs> are trying to achieve these days. We don't have to spend too much time on that. Um, and this is heavily, so the construction itself, which I'll say a few words about, it's heavily inspired by something called EMBL, which is uh, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory that's been around for a while. And it's also heavily inspired by the uh, extremely successful CIFAR LMB program that, that received the Turing Award, for example. Um, <coughs> And we, they will also evaluate the first uh, members, since we can't do that within Europe. So in one sentence, um, the unique characteristic of ELIS is outstanding academic quality, as measured, for instance, by publications in the leading competitive conferences in the field. It's a lab, <coughs> um, or several labs, around Europe, we don't know where, where there will be. There are two different forms. One is called a unit, which I'll say a few more words about later on. And then there is the larger version of that, which is called an institute. And there are programs being formed um, and fellows associated to these programs. I'll say a few more words about that. And there will be, um, uh, according to the plan, some early career awards um, which should be uh, uh, very attractive uh, for PhD graduates in AI. And also a PhD program. Um, so what's happening right now? Well, the, the, um, the proposals for research programs have been sent over the sea, so they are now in Canada, and they are uh, evaluating this. Um, and also evaluating the proposed fellows uh, who will then move on and form these units and institutes. And of course, as we've heard, there's now a big game going on in Europe about the money. So Ellis will have one uh, interest in there and we'll see what happens. Um, <coughs> uh, we spoke a bit about that. So this networking part of it has a, a few different roles to play. One of them is to enforce really strong connections between leading people in the area, sending people back and forth in various ways, and also to create a community to give a, a, a voice uh, for ML in Europe in this sense. Um, <coughs> oh, we can skip that. So one of those programs that I mentioned consists of um, these joint groups of 10 to 20 fellows, say. Um, and it has one to three directors that, that sort of leads the initiative. And there will be two to three workshops per year, and they will be co-located with um, uh, some of the major conferences happening in Europe that year. Um, and the fellows are also expected to play a role when it comes to supervision and mentoring of these younger PhD students entering the field, and as I said, establishing the units and institutes. Um, also providing strategic advice and quality control for new fellows. So heavily inspired by the Max Planck to some extent, for those of you who know that. Uh, so the selection process, the so nominations from the entire community is, is encouraged, and that has been uh, ongoing for a while now. And there will be objective criteria, such as um, 
high number of publications in top tier conferences, citation impacts, awards, etc. Um, and the people in Canada also put an emphasis on more subjective <laughs> criteria, which I think might be used later on as well, which is um, collegiality and, and willingness to actually make, make this happen. Um, so there are clearly challenges around. So what, what's happening right now is to put together these fellows who can actually start to work with this at a um, slightly larger level. And there is some uh, seed money for this fr from uh, Germany, who actually kindly co contributed some money to get started, at least <laughs> covering this year. Um, and at the same time, we need mechanisms for evolving young. And this, I think, is extremely important to Sweden, who is why I was now entering this area in a serious manner, so that we can get our young people on track here and get involved if this eventuates. So again, the long-term goal is to um, establish a U European lab within this area, uh, which will consist of several physical places uh, called institutes. Um, and again, in, as I said, modeled according to EMBL to a large extent. And that will take time if it is going to happen. So that's why this rather bottom-up strategy is being employed, where um, researchers start to, to build these, um, <coughs> uh, to build up the activity via these research programs, as, as I said. Um, so the units, let me say a few words about what, what it means to be a unit. So it's a commitment for at least five years, um, and existing labs can happily form Ellis units. Uh, and the recruitment of faculty is coordinated uh, within Ellis, so that someone else approves. Um, and the budget should be at least uh, 500,000 uh, euros per year to pay for salaries of Ellis faculty. Um, and they should be prepared to host visitors from other Ellis units uh, and also have their own budget of at least 1.5 million euros per year um, and also capability to receive no strings attached money from industry. And Ellis Institutes, I'm not going through the technical details there, but they are, they are significantly larger and more long-term. So again, just to briefly conclude, um, the long-term goal is to establish a European lab within this area. Um, <coughs> I think I have one little more thing. Maybe not desperately. Oh, there we go. And it's happening via a bottom-up process um, with, again, these proposals that have been sent in and nominations for fellows that has been submitted. Um, and the formation of these units and institutes have at least started. So that's roughly where, where it's at right now. Mm, thank you so much, Thomas.